Thank you so much, Kaisen. I wanted to get started by grounding this conversation and getting us to look at the starting point and the beginning of any movement. The foundation of many movements are rooted in a problem, an issue, or a challenge that needs to be addressed and changed. In my case, I launched Mark by COVID last summer, just a few days after I tragically lost my father to the virus. He was otherwise healthy, but lived in a neighborhood that was seeing the highest rates across the country. It's a mostly Latino, mostly immigrant community that didn't have access to tests, uh, let alone consistent information. Um, in raising my story, I found people all across the country who were experiencing the same type of loss, but also pain and suffering. And I knew that if I didn't continue to speak up and help provide these folks with resources to continue to connect and raise their stories, that um, I would be missing out on an important opportunity to address health inequities that disproportionately are impacting indigenous, black, brown, and other uh, people of color in our country. So giving circles like movements are focused on bringing people together and building community for change. So I wanna direct the first question to Lennon, Lindsay, and Eddie. What is the role that community plays in growing your movement today? And how should we be thinking about building connections with each other right now? So Lennon, we'll start with you. Can you help set the tone with your definition of community and then dive into your work for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a helpful place to start um, because community is one of those words uh, that's coming to mean everything and nothing. Um, so I think I will um, maybe start with what community isn't. Um, I think one of the primary misuses that we're seeing right now um, is the idea of community that's being confused with commodity. And so a brand's Instagram followers are called their community. Um, you know, we're also seeing um, that we kind of have a tendency to confuse, I think, um, connection with community, right? Um, a friend and partner of ours, Mark Friedman at Encore, talks about the aroma of connection does not a community make. Um, so in our work within the dinner party, what we're really interested in is community with teeth. Um, and I think what that requires is kind of three things. Um, and the first is knowing and being known, right? There's um, a necessary kind of mutuality to that. Um, and frankly, it's not a community if no one knows your name, <laughs> but like that obviously isn't sufficient alone. Um, and so the second kind of ingredient for us and um, that we th think a lot about is the role of care, right? Um, what does it mean to give a damn? about somebody um, and when and how do you create spaces in which um, every person knows every other person's story and they're known by other people right you're able to show up for one another as a result um, and you know I think at, at its best um, and again this is you know the aspiration always right um, and you know not always lived into or isn't challenging to get there but like what does it mean to create spaces in which you're seen for the totality of who you are right? Um, where there is nothing that you have to hide, um, where you have people who can walk alongside you through the celebrations and the heartbreaks and highs and lows of being human. Um, and really, you know, with whom you can talk openly about your inner life, right? Um, and what's happening in kind of really the subject matter of a, you know, uh, water cooler, um, literally or metaphor metaphorically. Um, and so, you know, and none of that can be one-sided, right? That's exchange driven. Um, and then I think the third thing um, that we spend a lot of time thinking about is the role of time. Um, that connection can happen in one night and in one moment, and it can be profound, right? Um, community is a thing that actually takes time. Um, it's not a one-time festival, but it could be people who gather every year for the same festival, right? Um, and have that kind of recurring element. Um, within our work, um, we're focused on building community um, among 20, 30, and early 40-somethings who've experienced a major loss. 
um, and giving people the opportunity to, knit, to connect with peers, whether that's in small groups, um, which we call tables or one-to-one. -one. And I think Kristen, as you so beautifully named um, in the origin story of Marked by COVID, and um, that what we so often see um, for folks in our community is um, that everyone believes that they're alone and that whatever it is that they're feeling and going through is the wrong thing to be feeling and going through um, because we live in a comparative kind of culture. Um, so a lot of our interest is how do you break that down, right? And how do you connect people um, with similar stories, both of loss of identity, um, who are going through similar milestones, right? And for whom that is but one source of real connection. And I think the reality, you know, is grief, um, like so many things, isn't a thing to be solved, right? It is a thing to be carried. Um, but isolation and loneliness that attends it is something that we can do something about. So our work is about how do we um, disrupt that disconnection that so often follows a loss? Um, how do we make our, ourselves and each other less afraid of saying the things that you know we feel like if we name out loud, we'll break or we'll be broken if we hear them, right? Um, and you know, how do we recognize that so often the things that we're really good at dodging um, are actually the like sources of how we kind of cut through the superficial um, and can be some of our best generative tissue for building real relationships. Lennon, thank you. I can already tell that I want five hours for this panel, <laughs> but um, let's uh, transition to Lindsay and just share with us the impetus for the pro bono movement and how it's grown over the years. Sure. You know, um, so often in entering into a conversation that relates to the topic of pro bono, as, as I often do, um, we kind of start from a place of shared understanding where, you know, typically there's this kind of assumption that pro bono is Latin for free legal work. And that is the origin story that most folks are familiar with when you think about pro bono service. But it, it is, of course, for the common good. And um, with the pro bono movement, as we think of it, and, and as Taproot has helped shape it, um, the idea largely behind this and, and what gave it um, so much strength and momentum so early on <clears throat> was really having the chance to think about a shared ethic. So what we can really borrow from and have built off of in such a fruitful way is this shared ethic of pro bono service that was so quickly grown within the legal community, you know, largely started in the 60s with this call to action from the White House and recognizing that it's one thing to enact civil right policies, it's another thing to actually make sure that they're able to come to life in the legal system and defended and supported through pro bono counsel. You know, that's the sort of origin story in a very simplified way as it relates to that more commonly understood and, and appreciated aspect of this work. But when Taproot was started about 20 years ago, you know, there's this recognition of the fact that any type of organization, any type of business or institution needs to have and be able to have um, strong strategy, sustainable finances, thoughtful HR support, all these things that are such an obvious core ingredient in every sector. And yet, as we all know all too well, in the nonprofit sector are, um, discounted for their importance from a funding perspective, at least in a sort of stereotypical conversation in that realm, um, and are also very difficult to access um, in, in the same way. And there's this recognition of the fact that you don't necessarily have to have achieved a specific type of degree or be certified by a specific type of test to have an identity as a professional. And when Taproot was started in 2001, it was really picking up on this idea of expanding the pro bono ethic beyond the legal profession into other professions and beyond that in also recognizing that philanthropy in a traditional sense with dollars is not going to be able to be the only source of resources to support organizations with what they need to achieve. And we recognize that in companies, you know, where financial investment that comes in is very important, but often uh, to some degree only as important as the things it can buy, the effective team the supportive marketing, the technology that fuels the work. So being able to really galvanize this movement within the other professions, identifying as a marketer, as an HR professional, as a technologist, um, this ability and desire to recognize the value and application of your professional expertise and find a way to bring groups together in true partnership to bring that to life has been such an important part 
for us and really helping to redefine and change the way that organizations think of volunteering, think of resources, think of philanthropy, and among professions really think about the, the ethic of you as a professional um, and how you can use those skills in a positive and meaningful way to drive impact. And as we say with our own tagline, to really make it matter. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for sharing um, your experience with Taproot, Taproot and the pro bono movement. Um, what an exciting way to be able to tap into individuals' superpowers to help build the capacity of organizations. Um, let's pivot to Eddie, um, and I'd love to learn more about your background and what you see as fundamental in building AAPI solidarity and community in this incredibly important moment that we're living through. Thank you, Kristen. Happy New Breath, everyone. My name's Eddie Zhang. Um, I'm the founder and president of the New Breath Foundation. Um, I, you know, thank you, Lindsay, for uh, sharing chat root because uh, when I was working in the community youth center in San Francisco, we actually uh, utilized the services uh, by tap root you know, for branding, for strategic planning, uh, just, it was a joy to work with many of the talents that come from different sectors. So I appreciate um, your pro bono service. <laughs> um, so, you know, for, for people uh, who are thinking about community as uh, what Lennon was talking a little bit about, for me, it, it's, we're never separated from the cell family and community uh, in, in this space. As soon as we start separating that, then we already fell as uh, having an understanding of what community is, right? And so as someone that who spent 21 years of my life uh, incarcerated in the prison industry complex, I understood how important community uh, was for me when I was incarcerated because uh, the connection to my family and to my community allow me to feel a value that I was not alone, that I have people that who actually cared about me, right? And so that community allowed me to continue to strive uh, to hold myself accountable, to be able to make the transformation that is necessary for me to rehabilitate myself, right? And so uh, through that process, I always knew that had it not for my community, then I wouldn't be here today, right? So, as we build, when we are we looking, as we're looking at the way that the xenophobia attacks, uh, the anti-Asian uh, violence that's happening across the country, uh, I very, uh, I'm very aware of the fact that um, this is not just one specific ethnic group that's being targeted, right? Is that our entire Black, Indigenous, people of color are being, have been targeted and is still being targeted by many of the institution racism and the violence that's historically been impacting our community. So in that process, we have to understand that we are not uh, separated in the way that we are dealing with trauma, in the way that we're dealing with success, uh, in the way how we navigate to this finite journey on this earth of humankind. So when, when I look at the building uh, solidarity within the Asian American Pacific Island community, we have to think about not only uh, what brings us together, right, but we also have to look at that our challenges and our safety and our liberation are tied to the black indig indigenous people and people of the color community. Because if we don't, then that, there wouldn't be a, a so racial solidarity in this space. And then we wouldn't have the, the permanent uh, personal and public safety that we all uh, want and hope for right, in this space. So therefore, I feel that uh, relationship building is definitely a key for us to connect with our community, to be able to understand how important that we have to support each other in times of need, and then we also need to celebrate each other in times of uplifting each other's culture and history, right? And the value that all, all we all share. So in that space, I would say that uh, having uh, 
relationship that is rooted in uh, looking at each other as human beings and rooted in compassion, I think that's how we're gonna move forward to this uh, racial solidarity that we all strive to. Thank you so much, Eddie, for sharing uh, that perspective. And I just really resonated with supporting one another with times of need and then celebrating one another. Um, that is so essential in bringing compassion to um, this particular moment that we're uh, living in. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and move on to our second topic of conversation, um, which is the framework for building movement. So we have seen a lot of movements recently rise and begin tackling a lot of the systemic issues that we've been living through. Um, it becomes necessary to begin thinking about inspiring consistent action so that we can tackle the root of some of these issues, which Eddie just so eloquently touched on. So to the folks on the panel, what do you see as a key ingredient to inspiring and sustaining a movement based on your research and work? And I'd love to start with Derek, if you could touch upon grassroots movement building um, and, and start us off in this discussion. Sure, so thanks, Kristen, I appreciate it. It's interesting because uh, in, in my work as a researcher and advisor to movements, I, I probably, and I, I picked up on what Lennon was talking about a little bit, which is you know, the word movement is often overused at times. And gosh, I think that the inquiries that come in and say, I've got a movement that I'm working on. And I'm like, is it? And then as a researcher, you're like, I need to evaluate a little bit whether or not it is. Try telling a leader and a social entrepreneur they're not actually within a movement is challenging. Um, but we have, and it's interesting for us as researchers, as we look around movement design, concepts and theories, and I do this at Oxford with an initiative called Movement of Movements, where we're looking at movements globally, it usually kind of comes down to four major elements wrapped around social issue milestones. So we always think about the pathway in which an organization, an entity, a formation of community has brought together in solidarity to try to achieve a social issue milestones. And What's, what's part of those milestones we usually see is the voice and tone of the narrative in which that they've created. So voice is always an important piece, the framework of how they express their belief within that social issue, and henceforth the narrative that's expressed within the community uh, as well. The second part of that is usually what we call the, the sort of movement pathway, sort of what is the journey towards public adoption of the social issue, either narrative or what we would call in our fields, KABs, knowledge and attitude and behavior change over time, right? So, so Eddie has talked a lot about some of the behavior change we need to have and see exist. That's going to take a shift and not just saying, well, one day I'm convinced that my behavior changes. It requires a knowledge and attitudinal shift within the individual or society in some way. The third really component of that framework are nudges and campaigns and efforts in which that we combine our voice and our social issue milestones, call to actions in some way towards incremental change. And then that last one is usually, and this is where it kind of comes a little interesting because there are some movements that have big infrastructures and there are some that have zero, you know, that, that really are designed within just volunteers and passionate people kind of coming together. So the framework is often a mix around social issue milestones, utilizing a certain voice and tone, a pathway towards social issue change, expressed through campaigns and community, built in and around some sort of infrastructure, loose or not, sometimes paid or non-paid. Now, I, before I kind of turn to some of my colleagues here, I, I mentioned that we like to measure that a little bit in terms of four categories. Um, we measure the effectiveness right now and whether or not somebody achieves actually those milestones we set out. We try not to look at whether they, you know, have changed social justice by 2040 or some ESG by then, which is, you know, that'd be great. I don't know what I'm going to be doing in 2040, but rather what issue milestones in the, in the near term, because the public cannot foresee that sort of long-term future. The other thing is, is whether or not the narrative of those milestones and the voice is being adopted within the public. So public adoption of narrative is very, very key. 
And BL and Black Lives Matter did very effectively with some of their narrative and their five points of what they wanted people to do. And we've seen that actually be very different here. The instigation level is the third one. And last one is obviously their ability to capture and grow leadership within, kind of grow as, as an entity. So just keep those in mind as you think about movement structures. And it kind of starts to realize that there are some movements out there and some that are really in the more formative stages, not quite movements yet. Thank you, Derek. I'd love to hear from others on the panel. Um, any reflections on that in your own work or other things that you've seen that have worked in building a framework for a long-term movement building? You know, one of the many things that I um, so appreciate about what you were sharing, Derek, and, and with your work as well, is a reference to campaigns and how they fit into and are a part of or can help drive and shape a movement but campaigns are not a movement in and of themselves. And I think we all probably in our respective roles and experience have encountered well-intentioned parties who want to launch a movement when what they really mean is I have a great campaign idea. Um, and it might be for a wonderful purpose, but one you know, sort of test I suppose is a way to put it that, that I always like to keep in the forefront of my mind is to add that question of to what end? And it's I think too easy um, across the various sectors in which we all work for there to be exciting and well-intentioned campaigns or energy that might be galvanizing around an idea or something that's cared about, but not always the ability to easily, immediately and passionately answer the question of to what end. Um, and while I know that is an overly simplified way of going about this, I think it is such an important step to be able to take in really helping to identify and understand the most meaningful and strategic ways to bring energy and effort together around something to go from the well-intentioned to the very intentionally designed um, when it comes to uh, that energy, when it comes to the opportunity to drive something and make sure that it's grounded in the ability to answer that question of to what end. Yeah, I, I want to share that I so resonate with what Derek was talking about, about this, the, this, the movement is because you know, when, when I was uh, in solitary confinement in uh, San Quentin State Prison for 11 months, because two of, two of my friends and I signed a proposal for including Asian American studies and ethnic studies into the college uh, program curriculum. Um, it was during that time that the community members, right, and, and my mentor, Yuri Kochiyama at, at the time, along with some students, they saw the injustice of it. So they got activated into creating the Asian Prisoner Support Committee just to support uh, me and my friends to get out of solitary confinement to address this uh, harm that was uh, created by the administration. From there, right, so the initiation about inspiring the ingredient uh, is that people has a commonality uh, coming in to they witness a social issue or injustice that's been done and it activated them because it connects to their value. So they jump in and start wanting to do something together. And as they're doing something together, they're building relationship and deepening that relationship that created a community, right? So as they created a community, now what happened was uh, post, post incarceration, the, for me, you know, the Asian Prince Support Committee were ran by like a group of volunteers that just with the a focus of supporting uh, the currently and formerly incarcerated individual uh, in the Asian American Pacific Island community who are impacted by mass incarceration and deportation. And from there, from a volunteer group ran uh, for about 10 years, right? It's just people just nurturing that relationship and continue to focus on a narrative shift that, that uh, Derek was talking about. How do you uh, change the behavior? How do you change something that people consider as uh, the, the injustice is happening? And now it became an organi organization uh, that is carrying movements that who are supporting people that who uh, are helping people to get out of prison, stopping the deportation, uh, changing policies. And now you have, uh, it became a, from a grassroots uh, uh, space, now they became a movement organization that is really making a difference in how people uh, are seeing uh, the impact of criminal justice and uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Lennon, 
Yeah, I would just jump in basically with an underscoring of everything that Eddie just shared. Um, as somebody who's oftentimes referred to as a movement leader, I'm like, I'm not one, actually. We don't have any big social milestones. And yes, we're interested in narrative change, right? And very interested in how do you lift up visibility around grief and grief as a social justice issue. But I think, Eddie, what you did so beautifully is to like point to, to the kind of connective tissue between community, right, and the creation of real community, the kind of like contradiction and tension point in all of this is that that requires not being transactional, right? It requires like community for community's sake, because as you also named at the outset of this, that is what keeps us alive, right? And we wouldn't be here but for, right? But you can activate a community towards a very concrete social justice end, right? Um, you know, and use that as a device towards a movement. Um, but I think like sometimes we confuse and, and sometimes I, I see within the kind of campaign world, right? Um, that what you're interested in is a very clear objective, right? And you are trying to insert the word community and to turn, you know, like your user base, right? Your like the, the people within that, um, your, the folks that you're trying to mobilize and to create a community, but actually all you're interested in is having them as like, um, is their kind of transactional role. And so I just hope that we can kind of separate those two goals because they're both critically important. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, add one more thing. It's funny you mentioned it. We, we often talk here that we've got campaigns, moments, movements, an expression of effort. You know, the, and it, it feels like you know, I'm dissecting all of the challenges that exist. And it's like, oh my gosh, if somebody is that passionate, we should just, but, it, it's on, but you have to help put things into context especially when we're looking at the movement space, because sustaining, because that's essentially what this question is about, a campaign is an, an effort at a particular time in which we're trying to achieve something in that. And I think um, one of the mistakes that some leaders make is confusing awareness for movement design, social issue policy change at times. Awareness is an individual knowledge, attitude, behavior change, right? I can become aware of something and do nothing with community. I, in a movement environment, it's focused on group overt action together for a common belief in change and what we want to see on a social issue. And we have to ground ourselves in those things so that marketers, leaders understand and so that we put the right expectation and resource into alignment as well. Wow, this has been so deep. And as somebody who uh, identifies at the sort of vanguard of uh, the budding COVID justice movement at the intersection of health equity, racial injustice, economic injustice, I'm going to be taking so much of this back as I work with uh, leaders that I'm developing. Um, uh, throughout this journey, but we are going to have to change subjects to um, move on to our next topic. And I want to talk a little bit about a the the changing world that we are living in, and and that context of online action and offline action. So, especially during this pandemic, we have all experience that building online community um, has been critical in staying connected. Um, but we also have lived and experienced um, the breeding ground of division and distrust that these online spaces can create. So I'm hoping to hear from you all just what is the role that social media, new platforms, and other engaging mediums have in revolutionizing the way we organize and build social movements? And how do you see us moving forward and engaging people um, online to activism and action offline? And so Lennon, it'd be great to start with you and get your input. Yeah, um, well, you know, and I think that that even the kind of framing of the question brings up the fact that community can be a device for exclusion too. Right. And we have certainly seen that within this last year is that creating a community of belonging when it is built off of who is not welcome here is a mechanism of driving distrust, right? And division. And I think that 
Um, you know, we don't talk a lot about oftentimes in kind of like the wake of a disaster, what you see are people coming together, right? And certainly we have mutual aid networks and lots of examples of that within this last year. We also have, you know, entirely too many examples of its opposite. And I think the uh, examples of its opposite are because we were not actually physically in community, right? When a tornado blows through your town or there's a disaster, be it uh, natural or man-made, and increasingly every natural disaster is indeed man-made. Um, but like what you have are people coming together and helping one another and unlocking the kind of tendencies to care, tend and befriend, right? Um, ch neighbors checking in on neighbors, perhaps that they didn't know before, right? And you see a deepening and a thickening of community in those moments. And this was actually a crisis that kept people in their homes, right? Um, and, you know, subject to the hate industrial complex um, and all of the devices, you know, that keep us um, deeply and, and quite often rightfully mistrustful of one another. So that said, I think I've spent up until the pandemic, all of our work um, was about using the Internet to connect off the Internet um, and to get people, you know, out of online spaces. Um, you know, in our world, the problem is not just, you know, like giving yourself kind of permission to talk about things that you otherwise don't. The problem, um, you know, in Christianism is so powerfully reflected in your work is that you actually don't know, you know that there are others out there with your story, you just don't know how to find them and where. And I think that we are in an incredibly powerful moment in which we see online technologies, right, giving us access and, and visibility into others who share your same stories. Um, and, you know, certainly within this last year, um, the kind of freeing up that that doesn't have to be people in your same neighborhood, right? I think we need to like go back and actually get a little local again. <laughs> um, but I also think that, you know, um, what we need are both. Um, I was, you know, like all of our work has been around dinner tables um, and I was pretty skeptical of whether or not you could actually get people to be real and honest online. Um, I think like personally, I've been quite pleased <laughs> to discover I was super wrong um, and that you can actually spark vulnerable deep connection um, through a screen as I'm sure all of us have um, been witness to even for all of the terrible Zooms that I'm sure we've all been witness to too. Um, over the last 11 months, um, our work has been around growing a community of communities and um, about 120 virtual tables. And so we've helped about 1500 people um, get together in kind of small intimate spaces. Again, um, we've seen a proliferation um, of affinity spaces and the ability to suddenly connect um, you know, around homicide loss, around COVID loss, around suicide, around, um, you know, looking for people who are also 26 and uh, have lost both their parents, right? Um, and suddenly the freeing, um, you know, of geography is the non-limiting factor um, has meant that we can see a proliferation of people's ability both to connect and to stay connected. Um, you know, I think I wasn't aware prior to the pandemic really of the ways in which um, you know our offline spaces were limited by access, you know, um, and so we have seen a proliferation, um, you know, an engagement of people with disabilities, you know, for whom the ability, um, you know, to access your second floor walk up, um, you know, wasn't going to happen, right? Um, you know, people who are uh, young parents, right, um, and can't get away for that, like meeting on a Tuesday night, um, you know, or a Sunday, or uh, can't, you know, do a 45 minute subway commute. Um, people in rural spaces who are longing, um, you know, to connect with others who share their stories, but might have, you know, in previous times kind of um, lived perpetually on a wait list somewhere because nobody had the tools with which to actively engage. Um, so I think for all of the ways in which we're seeing online technologies fuel division, there are like lots of reasons to be deeply hopeful right now. Um, and among them, I think, is, you know, the fact that we are suddenly in a place where our tolerance for thin relationships is lower than it's ever been, right? Um, you know, and it is, we um, are more willing to acknowledge and say out loud, you know, like uh, our honest answers to the question, how are you, right? And to be a mess. And I think that that deepens thick connections um, and oftentimes gives that this knowing that, you know, every movement um, can and must be powered and driven by the people who've lived that problem, right? Um, it is much easier to connect with others who've lived that same story today. Thank you, Lennon. Um, Eddie, perhaps you can share um, examples you see in how we translate online viral moments into real community change. 
Yeah, I mean, and just the whole online platform, the social media platform is uh, is powerful and then also very problematic in different ways, right? So, you know, we can spend days and days and talking about that. But one of the things that I have experienced uh, was too, is that um, when, this, when there was the, the, each, the challenges for all this anti-Asian attack against the elderly, against the uh, women, it's happening, it's being perpetuated on the social media and discussion on the social media. A lot of people are calling out to action for rallies, uh, for patrol groups, uh, for people raising money. You know, all those uh, are created a lot of different spaces based on people's lived experience or their connection or disconnection of the issues and of or the community, right? So when people are being activated, then that's the online platform allow the opportunity to be able to raise awareness. But at the same time, again, it's the, the way how we do it offline that is, uh, that's a way to do it in a way that we can call people in to really address, uh, 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 to create solutions to address systemic issues rather than just quick fixes, right? It has its role to play, but then the offline uh, relationship building and focus is more important. For example, uh, the, the, the video that went viral online about this elderly Chinese male was collecting can, and then this young person who say, I hate Asians, and that video went viral. It, it generated a lot of uh, different discussions. But what it did generate too is because the, 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 the survivor of, of that situation asked for uh, not to testify against this young person because he wants to give this young person a chance. As a result of that, the San Francisco District Attorney's Office was able to uh, build this restorative justice collective driven by the community, right? Members that who say that in situations like those, can we create alternative to punishment, alternative to incarceration, alternative to, to law enforcement and create a space where people can actually heal and get the support that they need, right? To address uh, some of those challenges. And what it happened is that the community member came together with the black community and the Chinese community. And we were able to really started this process of, of framing restorative, restorative justice principles and learning about them and starting engaging the community on focus on the opportunity to learn, to implement and to practice something that is not really a, a norm in our community, right? And so therefore uh, I feel that from online, something that is, went viral online and then that translated people offline to really taking a solution, uh, taking action into creating solutions to address a, a, an issue. I think it has a, a, a good kind of like a platform in transitioning right through that process. So I, th I think uh, in, in that frame, uh, again, I, I wanna say that it, it's all about how do you uh, build trust with each other right, in a community that allows uh, those type of action to become uh, something that is positive and rooted in love and compassion, again, and not rooted in division and separation. Because the online platform, uh, people can say whatever they wanna say online, but when you actually practice and implementing uh, something to really, to create space for healing, I think it's up to the person-to-person -person relationship building that, that that is the most important thing. Eddie, thank you so much uh, for those thoughts. Um, I am going to have to change topics so we can get onto our final topic. Uh, Lindsay and Derek, I would love to hear from you all and then we will move to closing thoughts from the whole team. Um, so our final topic is sustaining movements, short-term versus long-term strategies. Um, I know every single person on this panel uh, feels a sense of urgency uh, when it comes to our work. I'm wondering how do you balance the short-term strategies as well as those long-term strategies for engaging people in your movements? And Lindsay, let's start with you in the pro bono movement. Sure, and I'll share some thoughts and examples, you know, specific to our work and our experience. But then I actually think it is great fodder to turn it over to Derek because some of what I'm about to say is sort of calling out the thing that we've referred to as a pro bono movement as 
not really a movement <laughs> by that definition. And what that means instead for how we needed to think about how to drive sustained and beneficial change through what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so, you know, for us, I think pro bono is the means to the end. Um, while we ourselves in Taproot and, and in a small world around us are really passionate about the act of pro bono itself, the real purpose of providing this type of service and support is to ultimately achieve the end of what the nonprofit organization, small business, social enterprise is trying to achieve and to help fuel it and support it, right? So for us, the most important aspect of really grounding and sustaining in the short and long term um, the work that we're doing is actually finding the relevant channels, the relevant bodies, the relevant institutions that are already on the ground, um, either literally or proverbially, in being able to provide the support that's needed, that are already bringing together the not to overuse this word now, <laughs> the communities that we are looking to support, either the communities of specific nonprofit organizations and issue areas or communities in a more literal and geographic sense. And then looking to, to educate and ground the understanding of the pro bono ethic within the sort of toolbox um, of what folks are already using and understanding there. So for us, um, in particular, just using two quick examples, um, one really meaningful way to look to sustain um, this advancement and spreading of the pro bono ethic was looking first to see what different professions and sectors already tend to turn to for that sense of identity, for a sense of direction and purpose. Um, looking to be able to ground ourselves within those professional associations as we did early on, but then within the nonprofit sector, looking to see where institutions already look for support. You know, as a nonprofit leader myself, where do you turn when you know you have a challenge, you need to have it addressed? And you know, years ago at the outset, and now in similar versions since then, you know, that was looking to what was then the Foundation Center and the Foundation Center Library, and understanding that at the time the primary resource for a nonprofit organization was looking up in a grant catalog who provides grants to organizations like mine. And for us being able to take that similarly important mechanism and being able to really ground the education and awareness building around pro bono service as a resource that can also meet that similar need um, in the existing mechanism, in the existing institution, um, or area of knowledge that our sort of target um, beneficiaries will already use. And um, in more recent times in particular, that's also meant looking within the corporate realm as one of the primary sources often of pro bono volunteers who would be able to be a part of this work and identifying the fact that that ethic um, of engaging one's professional expertise um, in support of a critical cause um, should not just be grounded in the sort of traditional buckets of volunteerism, but should expand beyond that into all the other ways that those institutions are looking to leverage and engage their employees and talent, are looking to support communities. So ingraining it more heavily within the realm of philanthropy and as an alternate route um, of, of sort of cash equivalent philanthropy, ingraining the pro bono ethic within the realm of their talent development and recruitment. And by really embedding um, this ethic and this work uh, through existing channels and institutions, we're able both to um, drive and support that sustainability, but frankly, also to make sure that we are leaving the space for the parties, for the institutions, for the communities that are really um, driving this change and acknowledging our role in that as the valuable means to support that end. And I think recognizing that identity and where you actually fit within all those really important definitions that Derek helped provide is a really important part of understanding what it means to both sustain yourself effectively, but also doing so in a respectful and meaningful way in the environment in which you're fitting. Fabulous. Uh, Derek, we are winding down, but I'd love to get a few remarks from you on this topic as well. Uh, sure. So um, the, some of the best movement leaders that we have engaged in or embed our research teams in, you know, we find out that those leaders are amazing strategists. And the reason why they're amazing strategists is because they have game planned out what they need to do today and what is likely to happen with the opposition those who might not be the opposition today, but audiences, they fully understand audiences that support them and the audiences that don't support them. 
And they kind of understand from that perspective when there are going to be moments in the year that they can leverage. And they decide what does incremental change look like in the short term to what I'm going to have to do in the long term. So, and from that perspective, every leader, every leader from there has to sit back and say, I have this game plan for this way to make it relevant in this moment to accomplish these social issue milestones right here. I find that those that are just focused on awareness or short-term outcomes are probably the ones that are demanding institutional change immediately without any game plan for the long-term. And those are the ones that tend to fizzle out over time rather than the other strategist side of it. So I know we're out on time, but uh, hopefully it gives you a sense of conceptually where we see the, the change towards longer term. Thank you, Derek. Um, I'd love to hear more. We've had so much, um, so much to digest right now in such a short amount of time. Um, before we wrap, I would love to hear from each of you a uh, closing thought. Um, what is just briefly one final tip or piece of advice you would give to leaders or anyone who is looking to center people and community in their movement building work? Uh, Derek, we'll start with you and then go to Lindsay, Eddie, and Lennon. Uh, the best leaders have honestly listened to the audiences that don't support them. And what that means is that they understand what those people know and the attitude and the reason why for it before they just assume you should be on my camp. So if you're to create community, you're going to create a movement, you need to spend equal, if not more time with people that don't agree with you. Lindsay? I'll, I'll piggyback right on that to say that good intentions alone cannot be what fuels the work that's happening, um, the work folks are doing. You have to take the time and space and bring in the right folks to actually understand what it means to do it with intentionality, to understand how it should fit in and translate those good intentions into something meaningful. Eddie? I, I would always say that we must be willing to engage in a personal revolution before we're able to embark on a collective revolution. Because in order for us to build community, to be able to align uh, with other people, whether it's in movements, in campaigns, in whatever we do in our lives, we have to be able to be vulnerable and to have that personal revolution to understand our own our biases, understanding our qualities, understand where we came from and understanding that our liberation are tied to each other before we are actually being able to go out there and build that trust and relationship to be able to achieve that collaborative, uh, collective liberation. And Lennon. Yeah, um, I would just say that, you know, if this year has taught us nothing else, it is that you can't solve problems of loneliness and disconnection with self-care and no work worth doing can be done alone. And so I think like the role of community as previously defined, right, is one of the critical aspects of how we achieve the personal and spiritual sustainability to keep going in critically important movement work. Um, and recognizing that it is those person-to-person -person relationships that Eddie mentioned, right, um, that are like the nourishment um, by which we get get it done. Um, and so rather than just thinking of how you grow a movement, how you grow a community, think about also how you're growing the micro communities within it. Great. Thank you all so much for joining me and one another for this amazing conversation. I'm going to kick it over to Kaisen to uh, take us away.